Well, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that your son did come and bring peace, not only to Israel, but to all the world, and to each and every one of us who call upon his name. And so today, God, I pray that when we take a look at the story of your son, that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand, so that we may draw closer to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are taking a look today at uh, some of the reasons that we could have joy because of the arrival of Christ. And so today we want to take a look at Luke chapter 2. Uh, Luke chapter 2. Whenever we read the story of Christ's arrival, uh, we have to remember that he was a young man who was born into a Jewish family and that there were Jewish traditions that surrounded his arrival and his birth. And so in Luke chapter 2, shortly after we read the story of that was depicted earlier by our children of the arrival and how that the mother and father celebrated his arrival and the shepherds came and celebrated. Uh, they took him to the temple, as was tradition. And so in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 22, we pick up this story. When the time came for the purification rites required by law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him, that is Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it was written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what was custom of the law required, Simon took him in his arm and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you have you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and glory of your people Israel. In verse 36, we read that Simon was not the only one anticipation, anticipating the arrival of Christ. In verse 36, it says, There also was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Punel, the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after marriage and then as a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were willing and looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And today we want to just take a moment to, to look at, we've, we've been unpacking the story of Christ's arrival and how that his arrival brings joy. A few weeks ago, we started off by talking about the fact that joy is not happiness. It is not just that Christ came to bring happiness, because happiness is fleeting, but joy is eternal. And today, with these two stories, the, the message of Christ is recorded with purpose. And I see in these two stories a principle of joy for us, and that is this, that there's anticipation and there's acceptance. There's anticipation of salvation. There's an anticipation for joy. Now, it's hard in today's culture and society to anticipate joy. Uh, we all get caught up sometimes in the negative 
news cycles, the negative talking heads, negativity sells, right? You click on the negative. If you're like me sometimes, you're going through, whether it's your feed on Google or Apple, wherever you get your news, or you're on Instagram, or you're on YouTube, and you could scroll through, and it's like, oh, super nice thing happened, super nice thing happened. Like, oh, you'll never believe what so-and-so did. And which one do we click on? What so-and-so did. We just kind of are drawn to the negative. We anticipate negative. Those of you who know me, you know I love movies. And every time a new movie comes out, there's like a hundred people come out. This will tank. It'll be no good. Like before it ever even comes out. We just anticipate things are going to fail. We need to start to have an attitude of anticipating joy. That's what we read in the stories here. These two examples are two people who anticipated salvation. They anticipated joy. In the Old Testament, we, we have some examples of how that we should live. In Micah chapter 7, verse 7, it says, As for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. We need to watch for hope. Now, these two were watching for the actual physical arrival of Jesus, the Messiah. We now, 2,000 years later, can do the same in two different ways. Number one, in our own life. If you've never accepted Christ to be your Savior, if you've never brought Him into your heart, into your life, you can receive Him. You can be anticipating the joy of His arrival in your life. And you, maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you, you hear people who are believers and they talk about the joy of Christ and it doesn't make sense to you. It's not, nothing wrong with you. That's just the way it is. When you don't have it, you don't understand it. But when He comes into your life, you anticipate it. It arrives it's joy. Then you too can be like Micah and say, I hope in the Lord. There's no hope in your bank account. There's no hope in your career. There's no hope in another person. There's no hope in this world. Nothing will be fulfilling. There will be no true joy. There is only one source, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. So we can uh, anticipate His arrival just with as much passion as we read today with Simon and Anna. In Psalm 130, verse 5, it says, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. And in His Word, I put my hope. We have the beauty of having His Word. This last Wednesday, we had our family fellowship And I encourage you, on the second Wednesday of each month, we get together, we have a great meal, and we have a time of prayer, and we have a time of fellowship together. And, and we, this last weekend, we, this last week, we, we walked through some questions talking about Jesus as, as a child and his relationship with his mother. And we, and we kind of talked a little bit about this, is that she got to be interactive with Jesus. Imagine you had Jesus, and you could ask him, about David and Goliath. What was that really like? Ask him what really happened on the boat with Noah. What was it like hanging stars in the heavens? And we all agreed how wonderful and amazing that is. But the reality is that we have his word. We have the written form of him here today. And the writer of Psalms reminds us, in His Word I can go to hope. So if you've never experienced Jesus and you're like, oh, it's, not, it's not like I can go talk to Him, you can because His Word is right here. John chapter 1, we talked about this last week. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God and is with God. And it became flesh, but it's still the Word. It's the Word of God. 
Jesus told his disciples, you search the scriptures looking for salvation, but what it really reveals is me. And so we have the beauty to go, and if we anticipate and we want joy, we can go to his word and bring it into our life. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, For in this hope we are saved. Speaking of Jesus Christ. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what is already have? What we already have. But we hope for what we have not yet received and wait for it patiently. If you have never yet received Christ, if you don't see the logic behind it, the feeling behind it, you just look at others who are believers and you're like, I don't see it. Don't give up hope. Paul writes that you, you anticipate, and that's what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, convictions of things not seen. If you have not yet received and not yet seen, do not stop hoping. Pray that God will reveal the truth to you. Pray that he will open your eyes and your heart that you may see and receive the truth, because the second thing that we see in this story is not only did they anticipate, but when it arrived, they accepted it. They accepted it. In Luke chapter 2, verse 28, it says, Simon took the baby Jesus in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you promised, you can dismiss your servant in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. The salvation was Jesus. Anna came up and said, Praise be to God, and spoke about the child to everyone who would listen. That this was the thing that those who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem, here he is. This is the redemption. This is the salvation. This child. This beautiful merging of God and man. The Word becoming flesh. It's not in our human nature sometimes to receive God's Word, though. And we can look in the Old Testament for examples of that. Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, we see that God created the heavens and the earth. He put Adam and Eve in the garden. He blessed them with amazing things. And He says only one thing, don't do this. Don't take of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve could have listened to the Word and believed in the Word and acted accordingly. They could have accepted God's Word, but they did not. They rejected it. And sin entered into the world. They had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was very jealous of his other brother. And God in His sovereignty and love and compassion and mercy came to Cain, pulled him to the side and said, why? Why is your face downtrodden? Why are you so sad? Why are you so jealous of your brother? Be careful. Sin sits on the outskirts here, crouching, ready to pounce on you if you give in to what's in your heart. Because God knew what was in Cain's heart. And shortly after that, sure enough, Cain acted on his impulse and he killed his brother. Had he just listened to God's Word, but he didn't accept it. He rejected it. Time and time again, we can see in the Old Testament, Lot, with his wife and two daughters, are in Sodom and Gomorrah, and God puts out judgment on the towns, and He gives them a warning. If you leave town, you will not be destroyed. All I say is don't look back. Don't long back for that, that city. I have something better for you. But as they fled, Lot's wife turned around because she longed for that city even though it was wicked and she was turned to a pillar of salt. Later we see the Israelites when they're out in the desert time and time again. God had re rescued them from slavery, had brought them across the Red Sea. He had done amazing, miraculous things. And when they get into the land of Canaan, 
they had to do was just believe in what God had said. You will go and take this land. It will be your promised land. But instead, they sent spies into the cities and they came back and they said, Woo! We're like grasshoppers to them. Their walls are so high, I can't see the top of them. It's no way we can do that. And so they didn't believe God. Instead, they believed these men. And then they spent the next 40 years wandering around until finally they got it through their thick skulls. You know what? I'm going to listen to God. And when they finally became a nation, God was their king. God spoke to them directly through his, his representative here. But they said, no, we don't want you to be our king. We want to be like the other countries. We want our own king. We want a guy that we could see and celebrate, put a crown on. God's like, you don't want that. Oh, yeah, we do. And so God gave them what they wanted. And in short order, we can read throughout the history of Old Testament of the wickedness of the kings of Israel. And before we get too carried away by looking at them and saying, well, those were those people, we need to remind ourselves what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. He says, for all of sin in short of the glory of God. All of us have heard the message of God. All of us have heard the truth, but we rejected it at some point. We all struggle with acceptance. You know, it reminds me of the joke, and you probably have heard it, about the guy who heard on the news about the hurricane coming. And everybody said, if you're in this particular area, it's going to flood. You need to get out of there. But he said, oh no, the Lord will save me. And the evacuation bus came by. They knocked on his door. They said, hey, the water's rising. Your city is going to be underwater pretty soon. He said, no, I'm believing the Lord. The Lord said he will save me. So they went on. And sure enough, the water came. And he had to move to the second floor because his first floor got flooded. And the guy in the boat came by. And they came up to the window and they said, hey, get in the boat. There's still more water coming. Pretty soon your house is going to be underwater. You are going to die if you don't get in the boat. And he said, oh no, the Lord is going to save me. Sure enough, they took off and the boat left and the water came and he finally ended up on his roof and finally the coast guard flies over with the helicopter drops down the rope grab the rope we will rescue you and the man says no god said he will save me so they flew on sure enough the waters came he drowned he died he gets to heaven he says lord you said you were going to save me and God looks at him and says, I sent you a bus, a boat, and a helicopter. What else did you want? Now that's a bit of an exaggeration, isn't it? And it's a little obvious. It's a little silly. But it's not silly what Jesus did. And God sent us his son. And maybe in your life, there's been a boat and a bus and a helicopter. Maybe you've heard the message before. Maybe you've heard about Jesus Christ who came and lived a perfect life, who died on the cross so that you and I may go to heaven. Because we read that we all have sinned. All of us have failed. None of us are perfect. The wages of sin, Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, is is death. The consequences of sin is separation from God for eternity. But I love the rest of that verse says, but the free gift is salvation through Jesus Christ. But this is how gifts work. Gifts is something that someone gives and the other side of that is someone has to receive. God offers the gift for everyone. But it's up to you to receive. In John chapter 1, verse 12, we read, All who believed in Jesus and accepted him, 
he gave the right to become children of God. In other words, he gave them the right to spend eternity with him. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, one of my favorite verses. There's not a lot of guarantees in life. This is one that you can lock in. It is a promise for all eternity. In Romans chapter 10, verse 13, it says, All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This Christmas season, we celebrate the arrival of Jesus 2,000 years ago in in the form of a little child, a baby. And, And... Don't get me wrong, baby Jesus is cute. Baby Jesus is easy for us to handle. I mean, we literally could put our arms around him, right? We could handle that Jesus. But he didn't come to be a baby. He came to grow up to be a man and go to a cross on a hill outside Jerusalem and be nailed to that cross. And die. Because we read throughout the New and Old Testament that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. There's a reason that he sent shepherds to celebrate the birth of Jesus because Jesus was the Lamb of God. He was the sacrifice for all mankind. The question is now up to you. Will you accept that? Maybe the word anticipation has not been in your vocabulary. You haven't been anticipating good news. You haven't been anticipating hope and joy. But maybe you've been longing for it. Maybe you've been looking for it. Let me be so bold as to say what you've been looking for and hoping for and longing for is Jesus Christ. There's no present under the tree this year that will fulfill it. There's no person or thing of this world that will do it. It may bring you happiness. It may bring a smile, but it will flee. The joy of the Lord is forever. And it's available to you today. And it's as simple as this. A, B, C. A, admit that you're a sinner. We've all sinned. Those of us who have called upon Christ, we've all come to that moment where we had to bow our hearts and our heads and our knees to Him and say, I admit, I have sinned. I have wronged you. B, believe that He's the one and only way. Jesus told His disciples, He says, I am the way to the Father. No one gets to Him but through me. There's no other way. There's no amount of good stuff, no amount of charity, no amount of volunteer hours to ever wipe away the stain of our sin. It is only through Jesus Christ in the belief in His death, burial, and resurrection. And then finally, C, confess. Confess it first of all to Him. Paul says that if we, read, if we believe in our heart and confess it with our mouth, then we will be saved. And then secondly, confess it to someone else. Because Jesus says, if you confess me in front of other men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. In other words, Jesus will say, yep, that one's mine. Satan, you don't have anything on him. When the time comes, and you stand before God at the end of time, and Satan wants to pull out this list of things you've done wrong, he's going to be real confused because he's going to look down and they're all blank. Because they've been wiped away by the blood of Christ. Admit, believe, confess. Receive and accept the gift of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your son being faithful to the obedient life of coming to earth, living a perfect life, paying the penalty for our sin. Heavenly Father, I pray for those in this room and those who may be watching that if they have never accepted your Son, Jesus, that they will follow that pattern to 
admit that they're a sinner, to believe in your Son alone and confess to you and to others that they believe. Heavenly Father, I pray for those of us who may have already done that. Heavenly Father, may we truly live in the joy of the comfort and peace of that knowledge that our sins have been forgiven. We receive the greatest gift that it could ever be received. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone that hears this message. May the truth of your son's life and the liberty and freedom that he offers ring true today and always. It's in your name we pray. Amen.